Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, I had uh, well, there are two weeks since the last uh, lecture. Uh, I had some conference and uh, meetings uh, last week, so I was not able to uh, to provide a, a lecture then. But now we will uh, continue. Uh, I will first give a short repetition from uh, from the last lecture, and then we will continue on uh, uh, the topic on uh, forecasting. Uh, I'm sorry about the, the recording of the last lecture. Uh, it was not very good. There were some problems with the zone, which uh, apparently are fixed now. Uh, also, I wasn't aware of that the camera don't uh, uh, well, record the full blackboard. So that's why I will try to keep inside this part of the blackboard. So it's also possible to, to, to see on, on the recording. Uh, Okay, we will, uh, as mentioned, continue on uh, uh, on forecasting after a short repetition. But I will also today present the first assignment, assignment number one, which is a pass or fail assignment. You will have two weeks to um, uh, to solve the problems and uh, deliver uh, the assignment. And uh, then, as mentioned, it is a pass or fail exam, so you need need to pass uh, pass or fail um, assignments. So you need to pass to. Uh, uh, to continue the course. It shouldn't be too difficult, um, not uh, too much work on this assignment, but the next two will probably be much more time consuming. Okay, last time we started with the uh, uh, presentation of uh, mathematical proofs. We uh, looked at one particular types of, uh, uh, type of, of proof called uh, mathematical uh, induction. Uh, all the other formulas which we'll use in this course are also uh, presented with a, a proof in the textbook, but uh, I will not go too much in, uh, in detail in the mathematics in, in these uh, uh, formulas, but uh, you should uh, at least know about the principles of mathematical uh, induction. And as we remember, we start with a hypothesis. which is a statement or a formula, something we want to prove or to check whether this is true in general. And when we have this statement, then we can check, is this true for what we call the initial case, which usually will be the lowest possible number if you are going to prove a statement for uh, which is, uh, if a formula is valid for all integers, positive integer numbers, for example, the initial case will usually be to check whether it is correct for the value of, uh, uh, of one. I is the formula correct when you have only one element in the time series, for example, which is the uh, example we, we, we used for, uh, for showing the induction uh, proofs. So this is called the initial case. Start with a hypothesis, check if the hypothesis is correct for the initial case, and if so, we can continue. Uh, we saw one example uh, last lecture where we found out that, initial, that the initial case was not true, and then of course we can just throw away the whole hypothesis because this cannot be true overall if it's not true for the initial case. But if it is true, then we can assume, and this is what we call the assumption step, Uh, that the formula or the statement is true for one particular value of the, uh, the, the series of, of numbers, for example. And uh, we can if we can assume, assume that, then we should check, is this true when we increase by one? And that's what's called, uh, called the induction step. And if we can prove that, then we know the initial case is correct. And if we uh, assume that the initial case is for n is equal to, uh, to 1, for example, then the assumption step means that we assume that it is true for n is equal to a given number k. And the induction 
n is equal to k plus 1, increased by 1 from the assumption. And if we have shown the initial case is correct and the indu induction step is also correct, we know that if n is equal to 1 is correct, n is equal to 2 will also be correct, k plus 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. And since 2 is correct, then 3 must be correct, and then must 4 must, uh, must be correct, and 5 and 6 and so on. So for any number, we can increase by 1, and we have shown by induction that the formula is correct when, uh, when increasing by 1. So this is the principles of induction. Uh, and also go through a uh, short repetition from last lecture. Go very fast here. I wanted to show this one because here uh, we started looking at different methods for forecasting. And for forecasting, we want to find a, a formula or a way to predict what is happening in the future, the demand in the future. And we have several different uh, uh, well, ways of uh, uh, showing the uh, development of the demand. Here we have more or less random. We cannot say that there are no pattern at all. And we should try to find out what is the average the demand, which can be used as a prediction of the future. Because there are some variation, and there is, it is not possible to find any, any pattern at, at all in, in this uh, series here. Uh, in this graph, however, we can see clearly that there is a linear trend. The trend is increasing. The demand will be expected to be higher in the future than it was in, in the past. We start quite low, and then we have some increase, and of course we have variation. There will always be some variation, but the variation here will go around uh, uh, this line, which shows the linear trend. And we will later today look at different methods for uh, predicting uh, demand when you have a linear trend like this. Uh, this is also an option, what we call a curvy linear trend, which might be quadratic or exponential. It starts pretty low and then it starts to increase in a very high, uh, to a very high degree here. Of course, it will stop at some end because it cannot increase forever in, in this uh, quadratic or exponential uh, way. But uh, at least for a shorter time period, we can see that uh, it will be uh, suddenly the demand for, for this product will be uh, very high for, for a short period. And then what we also will, uh, I, don't, I will not show models for this in this course, but uh, the next example here is something we will uh, uh, look at models for when you have both a linear trend shown like mm, on this trend line and also some seasonal patterns here. It will vary around this trend line according to the seasons. You might have a higher sales in the summer months than in the winter months and so on, and there are natural seasons. And you should both, in this example, try to estimate the line, which uh, the, the trend line, which uh, shows the direction of the demand. It might be positive, as we have seen here, but it's also possible to have a negative trend if the interest of this product is decreasing. The product might be old and soon ready for replacement with a new version. And then the seasons will vary around this trend line. <coughs> uh, we talked a bit about the evaluation of forecast, and we have two main uh, methods of evaluating. One is called the MAD, the mean absolute deviation. Look at the deviation from uh, the, the what we call the here the forecast error, and the forecast error is the difference between the forecast and the actual demand. So we make a forecast in a previous period, and then we measure the forecast. Uh, against the actual demand in that particular uh, period. And then you usually will have some, some uh, deviation because it's very hard to, to get a forecast which fits 
exactly to the demand. And then we look at the absolute value of the deviation. doesn't matter whether the uh, demand is higher or lower than the forecast. We look at the absolute value, and then we sum all the absolute values for all the, uh, all the periods which we are using in this, uh, um, uh, for making this measurement, and divide by the number of periods. Uh, similar, we have a look at what we call the MSE, the mean squared error. It is more or less the same. We find the average divided by the number of uh, data points. Uh, but now, instead of taking the absolute value here, we take the square of the, uh, of the forecast error. And this means that when you have a period with a large uh, deviation, when you use the MSE method, this large deviation will have a relatively much higher uh, uh, value uh, since uh, it is, uh, you take the, the square of, of that value. For example, if you find the absolute deviation of uh, absolute um, uh, value of, of the uh, forecast error to be 5 here, you will add 5 to all the other numbers for uh, for the other periods, uh, but then when you use the mean squared error, you will rather have 25, which might give a much higher weight to that particular uh, period with when you have a large forecast error. Uh, and then we looked last time at uh, a method called the moving averages, which is uh, described as the arithmetic average of the n most recent observations for a one step ahead forecast. It look, looks like this. You find the forecast for period t as the average of the n latest demand. So the demand is the, the d values here, the d variables are the actual demand in the previous month, previous, second previous, and up to the n most recent previous. Sum all these demands together and take the average, divide by the number of, of data points. This is the moving average. When you get to a new period, uh, then you just uh, remove the oldest value from the data set and include the newest value and find still the average. So we have some Summaries here, we have the advantage, it's quite easy to understand, it's also quite easy to compute, and it provides a stable uh, forecast. If you have a situation where you uh, expect not to have any uh, trends or seasons or anything, you expect just that you have a stationary series of, of demand. Uh, there are also mentions on disadvantages, that it requires that you save all the past n data points, and you will always lay behind the trend. You cannot uh, find a trend uh, in this data until it has been uh, a certain number of uh, new um, of new observations, which is included in the uh, in the data set. And also, this is a quite simple method that will ignore the complex relationships in the data. And here we can see a figure which shows how the moving averages method will lay behind a trend. This is now the actual demand, and we can see that we have a trend line which is increasing. By using the moving average of three periods, we will lay three periods ahead, uh, uh, behind, so we will not be able to identify this trend until three periods later. And with the moving average method with six uh, data points, then it, you will lay even <coughs> further behind the trend. So here, if you expect to have a trend in the data, then there might be better methods than using the, uh, the simple moving averages method. So I think that was how far we got last time. And as mentioned, for, uh, before I continue, I will show assignment number one. It is uploaded in front so you can find it also there. <coughs> and uh, 
Uh, also, as uh, described uh, earlier, preferably you should work in groups for from two to four students, but uh, you can also just apply to, to get permission to, to work alone if you, that is more, more practical for you. And remember, of course, write the names of all the members of the group on the front page, so I know who is included in, uh, in this group. Uh, some always, uh, some students only, uh, well, forget to write the names and uh, assume that I can guess who is working together, but that's quite difficult for me. So rem remember to write all the names of, uh, of the members of the group on the front page and send it either by email to me as an uh, uh, attachment or you can also upload it in uh, Fronter and if you have more than one file uh, in some later assignments you might have both an Excel file and a Word file for example then just combine them in, in a zip file so <coughs> I don't have to deal with lots of different uh, deliveries from, from the same group. Publish date, well it was published a few days ago but at least this is the presentation date and the submission date should be Wednesday in two weeks and it will actually be Thursday morning because I will of course not check uh, this during the night so if, I, if it is delivered by uh, Thursday on at 8 o'clock then it should be uh, okay. So the first two problems should be possible to solve with the information you have so far. Two induction problem, the first one, try to prove by induction that this series, 2 plus 4 plus 6 and so on, plus up to 2n, should be equal to the n multiplied by n plus 1 formula. And n is then the number of uh, uh, of uh, the number of uh, digits in in this uh, in this series. So two plus four plus six. Then you know that n is one is the first element. N is equal to two is the second element. N is equal to three is the third element. As you can see here, three multiplied by two should be the exact value of six. And 2 plus 4 plus 6 should be 12 and if you multiply n equal to 3 with 3 plus 1 which is 4 so 3 multiplied by 4 should also be equal to 12 so this seems to be correct but you should now prove it by induction and the same for the second series of numbers here 1 plus 5 plus 9 and up to 4n minus 3 should be proven by induction to be equal to the formula n multiplied by 2n minus 1. So that's the first problem in this assignment. And then you have a problem on regression analysis, which I will present the theory for uh, later today. Here we have the sales of from uh, of this uh, Nintendo uh, GameCube in 2002. We have the monthly sales which is shown here as numbers uh, and it was introduced in uh, November uh, 2001 so this is the <laughs> first full year of sales and you should now show by this method called regression analysis and try to find uh, yeah calculate parameters and f identify the trend line according to this figure um, and then try to make a prediction for the coming periods by using this regression model and then compare prediction with the actual sales for the next per uh, periods from 2003 to 2005 and then answer what is the reason for the large deviation between <laughs> predicted and actual sales and suggest improvement of the model. And we can see by looking at this figure, we will also look at the, the numbers in an Excel sheet, but here it seems to be some kind of increasing trend. The, uh, the product was introduced in, uh, the, in well, the previous, previous year, so this is the first full year, and it was some kind of increasing trend here. So here you have at least by using the regression uh, analysis uh, method, you will try to find the formula for the trend line which describes this product 
at the best possible way. This Excel sheet console uh, sales um, GameCube is also uploaded in Fronter together with the text for the assignment. And here we can see the exact sales in numbers. And we can see that this figure is using the first 12 months, the month in 2002. Uh, starts at 61,000 and ends up at 619,000 here. So this is the uh, data points for the first 12 months. And then we can see the remaining three years in this, the, the same um, Excel sheet. So this uh, method should only use the data from 2002, and then you should show or check the method against the remaining uh, data in, in this uh, sheet, like this. So. That was assignment number one. So it's no reason to, to wait. Uh, you can start with that just after this lecture because you should know about induction. And also in this lecture, you will learn about regression analysis. Now, I want to present another method. And still, we are talking about uh, stationary series, like uh, the moving averages method, but now, I will present a method called exponential smoothing. And the exponential smoothing is what is defined here, a type of weighted moving average that applies declining we weight to the past data. And as you remember, for the uh, moving averages method, we had the same weight. If, you we, if we were using three historical data points, uh, the same weight was given to all the data points. The last months or last periods uh, uh, demand was given the exactly the same weight as the demand for three periods uh, ago. But now, this exponential smoothing will rather uh, use a higher weight on the most recent data. So we can say that the new forecast is defined to be this alpha is a variable which has to be defined, the w which uh, means the weight of the most recent observation. And this will always be a number between 0 and 1. So if this alpha is given a very high value, it means that the most recent observation will be given a much higher weight than the, more, uh, the, the older data. And if alpha is 0 0.1, for example, then 1 minus alpha will be 0 0.9, which means that 0 0.9 should be multiplied by the last forecast. And you can also uh, describe this. This will actually be the same formula written in another way. The new forecast is equal to the last forecast minus this alpha, uh, this uh, uh, smoothing constant multiplied by the last forecast error. So, if we try to write this in uh, with the with symbols, we can say that the f, the forecast for period t should be the smoothing constant alpha multiplied by the demand in the previous period t minus 1. So if we are making a forecast for period t, then we look at the previous period, which is t minus 1. And multiply by the smoothing constant and add 1 minus alpha and multiplied by the previous forecast. The f of t minus 1. And then alpha needs to be defined to be in the range of 0 and up to 1. If 
alpha is equal to zero. It means that you don't care about the latest demand, you only look at the last forecast. And if alpha is equal to one, it means that you will always use the latest demand and don't care about the latest forecast. A quite common value here is that alpha is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, but there is no, not necessary one particular value which is correct. And in every situation, if you're using this model, you have to try and find out what is the uh, the, smooth, the value of the smoothing constant which fits best to your particular situation in your particular uh, market. And this is a way to formulate this first version of the formula, but we can also show the second one. It means that the forecast for period T should be equal to the previous forecast forecast for t equal uh, t minus <coughs> 1, the previous forecast, pre forecast for the previous period, minus the smoothing constant alpha and the last forecast error, t minus 1, forecast for t minus 1, minus the demand for t minus 1. And here it is quite important to, you, you don't use the absolute values here because the forecast error can be positive or negative and that will depend on uh, whether you should have a higher or lower forecast in the next period. <coughs> so if you have a large alpha, you will have more weight on the most recent observation. If you have a small alpha, you will have a more weight on the previous forecast. So here we have uh, we are talking about uh, important decisions. We have the moving averages where you have to decide a value for n. Moving averages, you need to decide how many periods should you include in the, uh, the forecast in this method. And in exponential smoothing, you have to decide the value of alpha, the smoothing constant, which decides how much weight you should give on the latest observation. And here you can also see the same formula. The forecast for t plus 1 should depend on the demand for the previous period t and the forecast for the previous period. And since f of t can be given uh, or described in the same way, we can say that we define the f of t as the alpha multiplied by the demand in period t minus 1 plus 1 minus alpha multiplied by the forecast in t minus 1 and so on. You can just continue and continue and continue and uh, just split up the forecast with the formula for the forecast in this exponential smoothing uh, method. And then the method will apply a set of exponentially declining weights to the past data. And it's quite e easy mathematically to show that the sum of the weights will uh, sum up to be exactly uh, 1. But as you can see, alpha multiplied by the most recent demand, 1 minus alpha multiplied by alpha, uh, multiplied by the demand for two periods ago, uh, and so on. So this number will be decreasing all the time. And we can show the value here. If you start by an alpha value of 0 0.1, then the first or, or the, the, uh, the most recent uh, data will be multiplied by one, uh, 0 0.1. The second most recent will be 0 0.09 and so on. So the weight for the data will actually decrease all the time, like this. And we can also compare the exponential smoothing method with the moving averages. They are 
both they have some similarities. Both are appropriate for stationary series. So if we have trends or seasons in the data, then we need to uh, probably choose another method. But if you have stationary series, these two methods can be used. They both depend on a single parameter, either the n or the alpha. Uh, they both will lay behind a trend. <coughs> Since they are used for stationary series, they will not uh, find a trend until after a certain number of periods before uh, before they can uh, can update the, the forecast and uh, uh, and then will uh, be able to, to see uh, that this is increasing or or decreasing <laughs> and you can also achieve the same distribution of forecast error when alpha is equal to the value of 2 divided by the value of n plus 1. Which means that if you have a, a value of uh, 3 for n, the corresponding alpha, if you have a value of 3 for n in a moving average is method, the corresponding alpha will be 2 divided by 3 plus 1, which is 0 0.5. Then you will have the same distribution of forecast error on the two methods with when these uh, uh, variables will uh, uh, will fit to the formula here, but that doesn't uh, doesn't mean that you will get the same same forecast. So yeah. Also some differences, uh, the exponential smoothing will carry all past history, as we saw. We will have uh, the, uh, all, the, all the data points in history will be included, but they, the weight will be decreased uh, when the data gets older. The moving average will eliminate bad data after a certain number of periods. But also, the moving average will require that we store all the data points that we are using, while the exponential smoothing only requires that you have the last forecast and the last observation, like we can see here. We don't need to store anything else than the last forecast and, of course, also the, the last observation to be able to update the formula by this uh, exponential smoothing method. Yeah. This was a bit too f far, because uh, before I start on regression, I will show an example on this exponential uh, smoothing. Um, and then... I will just uh, show an example where we have uh, uh, three observations. So we have uh, three observations. The first observation is given to be 200. Uh, second one, 250. And the third one, 175. We have to decide about uh, the value of alpha, and we can say that we use first 0 0.1, and then we will later look at another value, which is a higher value, and see what is the difference on the um, for, for the forecast by using these two. So, of course, making a prediction from period number one, we are in period one, we have only one data point, then the forecast for period number two is given as the forecast for period number one 
if you use the Here we are. Uh, we can use the second formula here. Look at the last forecast and the last forecast error. Uh, no, we don't, we don't have a last forecast error. So it's quite easy to say that the forecast for period two should be equal to uh, the forecast for period number one, which we must assume must be uh, 200. and minus alpha multiplied by, by the latest forecast error, and that would also be zero. Since we need to, to start here. So looking at from period one, looking into period two, we can say that the forecast should be equal to 200 because we don't have any other data. And then we have started. Now we know the values in some way, and then Continue, look at forecast for period three. And the forecast for period three should be the forecast for period two minus alpha and minus the forecast error, which now is uh, defined to be F2 minus the uh, forecast error, of course. Yeah, F2 minus D2 should be. That's correct. And then putting in values in this formula, F2, the forecast for period 2 was 200. Alpha is defined, set to be 0 0.1. And the last uh, forecast error, now we are in period 2. The last forecast error is the difference between the forecast and the actual demand in the previous period. F2 was 200. D2, this is now the observations, uh, which also can be seen to be the D values, D1, D2, and D3. And D2 is 250. <coughs> Which means the forecast for period three, looking from period number two, should be 200 minus 0 0.1 multiplied <coughs> by minus 50. The forecast error is here minus 50. And uh, 0 0.1 multiplied by minus 50 should be 5. And minus minus means plus. That means that the forecast for period number three should be 205. And we can make another prediction for period number four. And I will just leave some space open here because we should uh, also look at another value for, for alpha after that. The F4 will now be the forecast for period 3 minus alpha multiplied by the latest forecast error. And if now we are looking at this formula, the second version here, but if you use the formula here, you will get exactly the same result. So you can do that by yourself if you want, just to control it. Now we have a forecast of 205, <coughs> this value, it should be, uh, we should then subtract the alpha smoothing constant 0 0.1 multiplied by 205 minus, and the demand for period 3 is 175. As we can see, 205 minus 175 is 30 multiplied by 0 0.1 means 3, 
and now minus 3 means that the forecast for period number 4 should be 205 minus 3, which is 202. And before we take the break, we'll quite fast also look at another value for alpha. If we are using <coughs> alpha is equal to 0 0.4, which is a quite high value, this means that we are making a much higher, uh, we are setting a much higher weight on the latest demand. And then F3 will be equal to, still 200, minus 0 0.4 multiplied by minus 50, which gives us a value of 220. Here we had a much higher weight, the smoothing constant was much higher, and that means that the latest uh, demand, in this case 250, will be given a much higher weight. So the increase here will go, instead of 205, it will go up to 220. And similar, if we now continue to period number 4, we have 220 as the latest forecast minus 0 0.4 and now 220 minus 175 should be 45 multiplied by 0 0.4 and subtract uh, that number to 220 means that we end up with 202 again. So the same forecast for period number 4 but we can see that the uh, the variation in period number three was, was much higher because of the different uh, weights of the smoothing constant. Okay, take a break, 15 minutes, and then continue with uh, this example.